The final item of business today is Members' Business Debate on Motion 14782 in the name of Sandra White on planned Bank of Scotland branch closures. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Sandra White to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank uh, all members who have supported my motion, enabling this very important subject to be debated today. Indeed, I note that Neil Finlay lodged a question regarding bank closures last year, uh, as well as a members of the debate, which was led by the now Minister, Kate Forbes, in December 2017. Uh, we should take note of the response from the Scottish Government that time. They stated banks should commit to work with local communities to establish a range of delivery channels that best meets the needs of their customers, including access to local physical banking services. And now here we are, a year later to the day, and again facing more bank closures. And they continue to renege on their commitment to meet the needs of local communities, including the business sector. I would like to read out an email from one of my constituents. It sets out exactly how the closure of the Bank of Scotland branch at St George's Cross in my constituency affects this community and beyond. I won't tell you the person's name, obviously, but I will read the email out. I'm emailing you in regards to the Bank of Scotland's decision to close its branch at St George's Cross. I find it very worrying that this closure will have a serious impact on the elderly and firm and also on local businesses. We are now in a position of not having a local Bank of Scotland from areas Bearsden, Torrance, Milton, Postle Park, Kelvin Dale, Kelvin Bridge, Annie's Land, Mary Hill and Cow Cardens. Quite a widespread area. The nearest bank will now be in the city centre. I'm just wondering if you and your parliamentary colleagues would be willing to use your parliamentary influence, he says, to approach the Bank of Scotland in an effort to reverse their disgraceful decision to deprive the good people of Mary Hill and beyond of a much needed and loved branch. I can just say to members in Parliament today, I have replied to my constituent to make them aware that this debate is taking place today. And perhaps the Minister, in summing up, could follow up my constituent's request and contact the Bank of Scotland with the issues that he has already raised. I also know information I received from the bank indicating the nearest branch in light of the closure of St George's Cross branch. Customers will now need to do their banking in person at Byers Road branch, Sucky Hall Street branch or their Guile Street branch, which is quite a distance away if you're elderly or infirm. In addition to this, they're also advocating the uses of Spa Shop in Mary Hill, a day-to-day -day store in St George's Road and a Nissa store in Great Western Road. Now, President Officer, this is simply not good enough. It's not serving local communities, particularly the frail and elderly, as I've already said, and it's not serving small and medium-sized businesses. And there are many of these across the constituency who rely on local banking facilities to bank their takings or change monies. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Graham Day. Uh, I thank Sandra White for taking an intervention. The uh, Bank of Scotland uh, closed its Canoustie branch in my constituency a little while back, despite the fact 47% of the personal customers used no other bank and used no other alternative means of banking. Now the Kerry Muir branch, which, uh, also my constituency, which serves a rather large rural hinterland, uh, it has 45% of its customers who use no other branch, and it's under threat. Would she agree with me that um, the evidence from Angus suggests that the Bank of Scotland cares very little about the needs of its customers? Yeah. Yeah. Sandra White. I, I absolutely concur with what my colleague has said and many others too, as in you know, emails that I've received and phone calls and visits to my constituency office. But I think it is much worse in, in Angus and other outlying areas. And I'm sure we'll hear from you know, members as they contribute to the debate. Now, I mentioned the fact about you know, people, local people and local businesses uh, relying on banking facilities to bank their takings or change money. And this brings me into another issue, which I've already mentioned. And I don't know if a lot of people know about this, but it's the subject of the use of what they call white spaces. Uh, these are in shops and stores, which I've already mentioned, and it supplies some banking services, but not all of them. And this is a very worrying trend. And this is particularly problematic for those which use card accounts. Lots of people use card accounts to uh, pay their rent uh, and various uh, bills, etc. 
And these white spaces are starting to be created in lo local shops which don't necessarily take these card accounts. And I think it's something that really has to be looked like. This is basically, it's a lifeline for a lot of people. The only way they can pay their bills and it's actually connected to the social housing rent uh, from housing associations. So that's something which has been raised quite often with me. Uh, there's also the case which is a knock-on effect of the, the banks which are closing uh, is the fact that the issue of post offices which I know has been raised by a number of people. It's been raised in Westminster also and raised by me. And Could indeed... Can you make an intervention on that? Yes, point? sure. Claire Hockey. I thank the member for taking my intervention. In the Burnside branch in my constituency has also been announced to be closed. And uh, when the branches have been closed, uh, all of the banks have been closed in Blanta and all of the banks have been closed in Cambus Lang. And the consistent uh, theme from the banks when they're closing is that people can go to the post office. Would she agree with me that that's not a suitable alternative? Often post offices are at the back of shops, there's a lack of privacy. It causes concern, particularly for elderly people going into lift their pension or lift substantial sums of money and they don't give the service that the bank does. Absolutely. Sandra White. I, I, I absolutely concur once again with my colleague also. It's not just obviously the lack of the personal banking as well, but as I'll go on to explain, it really does have a knock-on effect in post offices. It certainly has a knock-on effect on businesses who can't you know, leave their money overnight or whatever it may be. So yeah, it's really, really very worrying that post offices are actually being used as a substitute for banks. And I wanted to go into more about that, the fact that post offices are being utilised more uh, and more as bank closures actually take their toll. Now, these post offices are doing a fantastic job, uh, what they have to do, uh, some in, in very deprived areas where banks have closed. And they're the only means for people to be able to either pay bills or, or get monies out of. But they're not being treated equally. And the Postmasters you know, Federation, I've met with them, uh, and I was going to host an event, and I will, in the Parliament. They're not being tre treated exactly the same as the banks are being treated. Um, basically, if you deposit money with a bank, the bank gets more money. If you deposit with a post office, the post office submasters don't get the same amount of money. And the biggest worrying part is the cost of operating ATMs. Now, banks and building societies are exempt from, from rates for ATMs, but post offices are not. Post offices are required to pay the rates, and these costs are, are increasing all the time. And it's a real fear, which I've heard from postmasters and others as well, mostly post offices and postmasters, that the lifeline which the post offices are now becoming for our communities, with the lack of support and the lack of monies and more charges, they won't survive. And what happens then? So the banks have a moral responsibility to look at that knock-on effect that they're having in post offices. And I know it's been raised in Westminster by other colleagues as well. So it's, it's a very worrying time. People should be able to access the, their banks. Not everybody does internet banking. I don't do internet banking. I like to talk to somebody eh, or a phone, whatever it may be. But I don't do internet banking. There's lots and lots of people who don't even have access to a computer to do internet banking and don't like internet banking. But the sheer knock-on effect of these bank closures to communities, my area, I have loads and loads of small SMEs which can't bank their money. They've got to go and find a post office, whatever it be. It's got a huge knock-on effect for communities and local businesses as well. So, presiding officer, I hope the minister in the summing up can answer some of the questions that's been raised, not just by me, but colleagues as well, and indeed raise them with the banking industry. The banks have a social responsibility to the people that they serve, businesses and local communities, and really they should recognise that. Thank you, presiding officer. <laughs> We move to the open debate and speeches of up to four minutes, please. Jamie Halker johnson followed by George Adam. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank um, Sandra White as well for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber? Um, while the branch network has been in decline for some time, it's become clear that in recent years that those closures have uh, gained pace. This has left us in a position where the very future of branch-based bank services are, are at threat, services which are still utilised by significant cross-section of our constituents. Now, if we're looking potentially to a future envisaged by our bank, uh, but major banks, where a truly a nationwide branch network covering small towns and villages like many of us represent is no longer considered within their economic interests. What a future scaled-down network will look like and how banking services continue to be offered to customers is, however, still unclear. 
Two of the branches affected and included in today's motion are located in my region of the Highlands and Islands in Keith and in Lossiemouth. Both are relatively substantial settlements in Murray. Both maintain a range of businesses that might not be found in similarly sized towns in the central belt. But both are losing their Bank of Scotland branches and Bank of Scotland are removing the ATMs too. The Bank of Scotland branch in Lossiemouth is the last remaining bank in that town. And the decision to close it comes at a time when there is major investment being made by the RAF in Lossiemouth. Investment which will bring hundreds of thousands, uh, sorry, hundreds of new residents, families and visitors to the town. But there'll be no bank. Yes, of course. Richard Lockhead. Can I thank the member very generously for giving way and also for raising the subject of the proposed bank closures in my own constituency uh, in Keith uh, and Lossiemouth. And I'm sure he's aware that Murray have lost 40% of their high street bank branches in the last eight years and there's a lot of strength of anger in relation to the proposals for Keith and Lossiemouth. And does he agree in the case of Lossiemouth in particular, where there's a, a proposal to shut the last bank in the community with all the damage that will inflict the local community having no high street bank, that extra safeguards should be put in place by the banks themselves or if need be by regulation by the UK government to prevent that happening? Jamie Halcrow Johnson. I uh, thank the member for that um, intervention. And obviously, this is something that we've discussed at the Economy Committee and covered during our uh, inquiry, to, inquiry into this. And we recognise that not only did there need to be uh, a particular view taken when, the, when it is the last bank in town, but also recognises the impact, recognising the impact that can have, particularly in communities in areas like the Highlands and Islands where um, banks are so, can be so uh, spread far apart. Um, and that is the story of the Highlands and Islands. Our geography has meant that local residents are more dependent than most in Scotland on these small towns and the services that they provide. And while closures are a national trend, it is locally uh, that the impact is most keenly felt. The two proposed closures in Murray have received objections from the local community. Uh, my colleague Douglas Ross um, has organised public meetings in both towns to put residents' concerns to the Bank of Scotland. And they were attended by representatives from Murray Council, from local community councils, from the post office, and from local business organisations, including the Lossy Mouth Business Association and the Federation of Small Businesses. But they were not attended by representatives of the Bank of Scotland, who were empty chaired at both meetings. Now, it would, however, be unreasonable not to acknowledge that the greatest proportion of bank closures has not been in the Highlands and Islands. That was among the findings of the Economy, Energy and Work Committee's inquiry on the subject, and that's not something that I dispute. However, as I've spoken about, the geography of the region means that even fewer closures can have a disproportionate effect. In many cases, the nearest alternatives uh, are often more distant and less accessible, particularly by public transport. Highlands and Islands Enterprise also found a significant increase in the use of mobile and online transactions in its report commissioned on access to banking services. Many banks have expanded the scope of their remote banking options in recent years, for example, allowing checks to be paid online, and that is to be commended. However, as High's report notes, this is dependent on strong connectivity, which in many parts of my region are simply absent. And this is partly the reason why cash transactions remain more common, particularly in the context of the region's many small and medium-sized enterprises. As I said at the outset, it is unclear how residents are expected to adapt. While adopting the lessons of digital inclusion will be key, there is a role for branch-based banking. One commonly heard issue, of course, is the use of banking services through the post office. But as many constituents would tell us, the post office network itself has declined. And this can present a particular problem on island communities, even where cash machines can be, uh, can be distant. The Economy Committee's find, uh, fines also extended to a number of barriers to the post office simply taking over wholesale, the role of ban branch, ba uh, branch banking. Banking hubs have also um, have a mix of benefits and challenges, but potentially an opportunity to better integrate with other community facilities. The reality, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that significant reductions in banking services available to remote and rural communities continue to create problems. We are still seeing closures where the alternatives are not clear. That is a negative for communities who have grown used to the local branch. In many cases, even small branches can be key so in maintaining town centres where, uh, where businesses come to uh, react. Most people are dismayed by the bank's retreat from the high street and the level of closures that have been announced. It is to these views from their own customers that the banks should be listening. George Adam, followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, presiding officer. Initially, presiding officer, I was going to actually articulate my arguments with the notes that I had here in front of me, but I've decided that I'm absolutely sick of this nonsense. I'm sick of getting a letter at the last minute from a major corporation or a bank telling me the devastation they're going to cause in my community. I'm absolutely sick 
of an email, and on a letter that tells me that there's only 0.8 miles to their nearest branch in Sucky Hall Street. Now, most of you will work out that Sucky Hall Street isn't in Paisley, and the letter was just such a cut and paste effort that they hadn't taken the time to actually tell me that it was the Paisley South branch in my own hometown. So I'm, I'm angry about this because we are now in a position in Paisley where we only have one Bank of Scotland, one Royal Bank of Scotland, and every single branch, at one point with the Bank of Scotland, we had Bank of Scotland South branch, two central branches, plus one in the west and one in the east. Now we just have that one branch. How are many of the older people in my community? And when you talk about, when you actually talk about the community in the south end of Paisley, there are three or four high flats that are all full of families that have been in there since the day these flats were built. Uh, and now many of them are older and they uh, have mobility issues. One of the flats in particular has been adapted for older people with uh, uh, mobility issues. So they bank in their local bank. They see the face they've seen in numerous times. They don't know one end of a computer from another. So don't ask them to do online banking. And also, presiding officer, don't ask them to go to the local post office because many of us in here will have had the post office uh, uh, the post office uh, people coming to us and saying that the uh, sub post office masters are struggling to actually make a living with the services that they currently offer. They are still struggling there and they're getting more and more and every time a bank closure happens, they say that the only way forward is to get the services at your local post office. Now that network is under pressure, as is the bank network. So don't every time you decide to make a commercial decision. And don't get me wrong, this is a commercial decision. Look, we bailed them out, and we are the ones that are still suffering after all these years. It's older and a disabled community in my town that are going to be the ones that are suffering because of Scotland's largest town. Scotland's largest town is going to have all their major banks within 200 metres of one another, 200 metres in a town that's the, the biggest, it's actually the biggest town in Europe, let alone in uh, Scotland. So when you sit there and you look at that, where is the logic in this? Where is the support that we've often asked from these banks when we've given them? I've said to many of my constituents, don't support them. If they don't support you and our community, don't you support them. Change your bank because it is a lot easier now than what it was in the past. And I've done that. I've actually done that myself. What the bank I'd banked with for years was pulling out Paisley. They told me they had a lovely branch right smack in the centre of Glasgow. I said, well, sorry, that's it. We're having a partner of the ways. And I went to a branch in a local, one of the local Scottish-based banks that spent £400,000 in their HQ in Paisley. And I decided, well, I was going to do that. If they're going to invest in my town, if they're going to show that there's a future in my town, then I'm going to back them as well. And I think this is what we've got to look at here because for far too long, far too long, they've actually thought they can just dictate here. They get the email at the last minute. The email's an afterthought. They don't even try and talk to the community. They don't even try to engage with the community. They leave it to the last minute to the uh, parliamentarians and then you end up talking, you drag them in, you have the meetings with them, you say, you know, this community can't uh, have this, you need to do it. I went through the same thing with the Bank of Scotland in the East End of Paisley. And because uh, again, it was a similar demographic of older people there as well. You bring them all in and at that point they say, we'll listen to you, we'll do what we can. They're just, they're just doing a tick box exercise. They've got no interest. These banks, these institutions are purely in it for themselves and they need to remember that we are their customers. Our communities are the ones that are suffering and they need to de make, decide what they've got. And in my branch, I would ask them at this late stage to actually look at it again, look at the people they're serving and make a different decision. Thank you. Monica Lennon, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm grateful to Sandra White for bringing forward this important debate. Um, as we can see, that it's an issue that concerns us all. And I think we all share the anger that we've just felt from, from George Adam and the concern about the very serious impact that this is having and will have on the communities that we represent. Several RBS branches in my Central Scotland parliamentary region have already faced closure, including in Hamilton, Lark Hall, Airdrie, Bells Hill and Steps. And now Stonehouse is face facing the closure of its Bank of Scotland branch. And this has happened again without full consultation with customers. And there's another example of the banks treating loyal customers with 
contempt. Um, and I'm very concerned about the cumulative impact of all of these closures. Banks are literally profiting from the closures and customers are paying the price with increased travel costs, uh, with having to go in to visit branches in, in neighbouring towns or, or into the cities. Um, people are already experiencing quite a poor customer service and are seeing longer queues and waiting times in the branches that are remaining who are picking up the pieces. Now, the banks are telling us that they're responding to changing customer behaviour, but it looks like a cost-cutting exercise and communities are losing access to valued local banking services. So I completely reject the idea that there is no demand for local banking services. High Street bank branches are closing at an incredible rate of 60 a month. That's according to which. And meanwhile, a YouGov poll found that 58% of people and 68% of small um, business customers said that a bank branch is important to them. And I think Sandra uh, White's constituent made some of those points uh, very well. Um, so bank branch closures are not just a, a mere inconvenience. Um, I think all of us would agree that it's some of the most vulnerable people in society that are going to be hit the hardest. Sandra White again talked about the impact on older people, people with disability and, and mobility issues. And Age Scotland highlighted that a substantial proportion of older people in Scotland are not connected to the internet and that number increases with age. One fifth of UK households are now more than three kilometres from their nearest branch. Again, that is according to which. So longer journeys are concerning for people with mobility issues and additional travel costs will affect the poorest who simply don't have the spare cash to get a bus to the bank or even a taxi if the bus services are not there and reliable. And others have talked about the importance of, of local businesses being able to access banking. These businesses are the backbone of our economy and will be damaged by these changes. Of course, bank branch closures means there's an increasing reliance on ATMs, but free cash points are also disappearing from our high streets and in place are ATMs which charge their customers. So to go back to Stonehouse, it's losing its Bank of Scotland branch and two out of the five available ATMs in the area at the moment do charge the customer. So there's a real risk of financial exclusion for vulnerable people and it can't continue. Communities need greater protection against these banking and ATM deserts. Um, and no one should have to worry about having to travel three kilometres to access a bank or pay to access their own money. Um, this is why Scottish Labour have called for mandatory consultations on bank branch closures. And my Labour colleague, Jed Killen, who's the MP for Rutherglen and Hamilton West, has been leading the way in West Westminster with his proposals on a ban of ATM charges. So we're serious about, about these issues. Um, again, in closing, I just want to thank... Sandra White for giving us the opportunity to discuss this, albeit briefly tonight. We can't abandon communities by leaving them without the basic banking infrastructure that they need. Banks have a responsibility to meaningfully consult with customers, but there's also a real and pressing need for government intervention uh, at a UK level. Um, Labour in Westminster and here in Holyrood will continue to condemn and oppose these bank branch closures and ATMs and we welcome the opportunity to work cross party to stand up for our communities on this issue. Stuart Stevenson followed by Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. It's one of these occasions where I feel uh, very grateful. I'm more than a sword's length from any of my colleagues in the Chamber uh, as I declare that I'm a shareholder in the Bank of Scotland, um, uh, which, of course, came from my 30 years of employment. Uh, that ceased nearly 20 years ago. Um, a few facts about what's going on. Uh, Spice tell us a third of bank branches in Scotland uh, closed in the last 10 years. Uh, which found that 78% of consumers in the two lowest income households rely on cash, with 26% saying they never use card payments. And among over 65s, 80% are reliant on cash. And research uh, by Reuters showed that 90% of bank branch closures in the last year have occurred in areas where the median household income is below the national average. So what this is telling us is, yes, we're having closures, but they are adversely affecting those least able to cope 
with these closures. It's a socially discriminatory uh, activity, uh, which we will all pay the price for uh, if it continues in the way it is. And indeed, uh, where ATMs are concerned, they're closing across the UK at a rate of 250 a month. Uh, just a little observation about ATMs in Scotland, of course, should not be closing so fast. Because the Scottish banks issue their own banknotes, they can actually fill the cash dispenser at no cost beyond the printing of money. Whereas in England, you have to pay a pound for every pound that you put in the cash dispenser. So it's much cheaper to run ATMs in Scotland. So we shouldn't see uh, the same rate of closures. Typically, there'll be 40,000 uh, pounds in a cash dispenser. Now, banking is actually a very simple business, although bankers seem to make it look very difficult. Uh, you take some money in and reward the people who give you the money from the deposit. You lend money out and you charge people and there's a transaction system sits in the middle. And to make banking work, you just need to get the two sides of the equation at work. Now, why do bank branches develop the way they used to? And the answer is because the rural branches were typically where people deposited money. And they came into the cities and in the city branches you lent the money out. Because that was the model traditionally of banking, trustee savings bank in particular, that you funded the lending from your depositors. And that was a safe model for banking. Uh, one of the contributors to the bank crash in 2008 was that banks had increasingly gone to the wholesale markets to get money and had moved away from keeping the two sides of the banking in balance. And that didn't help. Um, I just want to say in my previous constituency, they changed the boundaries in 2011, in New Deer, the Clydesdale Bank uh, announced they were going to shut the branch there. That community of some 600 uh, people was outraged by this, got themselves together and bought the bank branch and then persuaded the Royal Bank uh, to move in and run the bank. And it's still there to this day in face of all these closures. And that was very largely down to uh, a dear and now departed colleague, Councillor uh, Norma Thompson. But of course, she was one of a whole range of people in the community. And the point I'm making is that there is potential scope for community action and making banks uh, responsive to the communities in which they operate. And let me just close by giving a very particular example of the risk that banks are taking in disconnecting themselves from the communities. And it comes from South Africa in the early 1990s, where in the townships of Soweto and Kailicha and elsewhere, uh, people who had informally built the houses wanted to regularize their position, start to get engaged in the formal banking system. The traditional banks would have nothing to do with these people whatsoever because of their situation. What actually happened? They set up their own banks and deserted the traditional banks. And that's potentially what will happen to Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank of Scotland, the traditional banks here. And if you think that today the population of Soweto is 1.27 million people, it is not a trivial matter that these people have deserted the traditional banks and taken their own banking fate into their own hands. And the same sort of thing can happen in Scotland. So these so-called, so-called commercial decisions ultimately can be in the commercial disinterest of these organizations that are devastating so many communities, particularly those who are most affected by the closure of banks because they are those who have least in our society already. Presiding officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I welcome the chance to speak in this member's business debate and thank Sandra White for bringing it forward. Bank of Scotland bank closure, branch closures in the North East region have and will continue to have consequences for many of my constituents, in particular in Dundee and Currie-Muir, with branches closing in both of these places. Uh, for clarity, let me say that I'm a customer of Bank of Scotland and also the Lloyds Banking Group that owns Bank of Scotland. Bank branch closures have been steadily increasing for the last few years. The number of bank branches in Scotland fell by a third between 2010 and 2017, with five banks closing 488 branches between them. Bank of Scotland has shut 87 branches since 2010, going from 293 to 206, a 30% decrease. 
Robin Bullock from Bank of Scotland told members that the 30% reduction in the number of branches was a measured and gradual approach, taking into account the changing habits of customers with people shifting to online banking services. However, Holyrood's Economy Committee found that closures had left communities and local businesses feeling abandoned. In March, the committee opened an inquiry into bank branch closures, aiming to gather evidence on the effect on local businesses, customers and the economy. Upon closer questioning of the five banks, Bank of Scotland, RBS, Clydesdale Bank, TSB and Santander, it emerged that none of the banks had a formal consultation process with local people before deciding to close a branch, as many of the contributors have commented on. The closure of Bank of Scotland's flagship city bank branch in Dundee is a blow to customers and staff alike. The Bank of Scotland city branch on the Nethergate will close at some point between February and June of this next year. This is yet more bad news for the city. Last year, more than 250 jobs were axed at the Bank of Scotland Group's call centre in the same West Market Gate building after it was closed. Following this closure, some staff were offered voluntary redundancies, while others were offered the chance to transfer to the bank's Dunfermline call centre, which is, of course, more than 50 miles away. Current customers of the branch set for closure in 2019 will at least have their accounts uh, realigned to the Bank of Scotland's Fairmure branch on Cleppington Road, which is two miles away. Bank of Scotland bosses have blamed the latest decision on the changing ways customers choose to bank, claiming that 79% of Dundee City's personal customers predominantly use telephone or online banking or alternative branches. A Bank of Scotland spokesperson said, we have made the difficult decision to close the Bank of Scotland Dundee City branch in February 2019 due to the changing ways customers choose to bank with us. Customers can continue to access their banking locally by visiting the nearby post office, which is less than half a mile from the branch, an answer we've heard in, from, from others. However, while many people are switching to online banking, there are concerns among many communities of how these closures will affect them, in particular the vulnerable, elderly and disabled. According to Age Scotland, 37% of, of people over the age of 60 in Scotland do not use the internet, which is equivalent to the size of Edinburgh's population. My colleague Gordon Lindhurst, MSP, has said that members of the Economy Committee and the Scottish Parliament were in no doubt that the loss of branches has had negative impact on communities and businesses across Scotland. Kiri Muir in the North East region will have no physical Bank of Scotland branch after the bank announced its branch there is to close next year. The town has a population of around 6,500 to 7,000 people who will now be left without a bank. This, is not, this not only deprives residents of a service but also affects shopkeepers and business owners who are already under normal commercial pressures. The nearest bank for those living up Glen Isla will probably be Blair Gowrie while others will have to travel to Forfar for their closest Bank of Scotland branch. A 2017 report by UK Finance found that 71% of adults used online banking in 2017, amounting to 38 million people. Furthermore, debit and credit cards overtook cash and coins as the most commonly used method of payment in the UK last year. Many people feel as if they have been abandoned by the banks following these closures, with alternatives offered not meeting their needs. It is vital that people have access to cash and face-to-face -face banking services. As the Economy Com Committee concluded, the banks must engage properly with people and businesses on their needs before deciding to close branches in future. As we can all see across our constituencies that have been affected by bank branch closure, it is not just the customers who suffer. Jobs, businesses and the high street also feel the impact of these closures. Job losses in empty buildings on what were once busy shopping streets are proof that there have been and will continue to be neg many negative impacts of bank branch closures. Thank you. I would now ask Kate Forbes to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank Minister. you, Presiding Officer, and I also want to thank Sandra White for raising today's motion, although it is with some sadness because it has only been two months since the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee brought 
the issue of bank closures to this chamber and we're here again today debating the same subject and that is uh, very disappointing. My own views on the subject are on record because as Sandra White said, um, I raised a motion myself uh, as for members debate um, about a year ago uh, on the subject and it sounds like a bit like a broken record raising the same concerns, the same worries uh, time and time again and not getting the sense that these issues are being responded to. Sandra White started by listing the um, long list of areas in her constituency where there is no longer a branch presence and I started scribbling them down but there were so many I didn't get very far and that in itself tells the story of the number of communities that are now expected to travel and for some people that may be part and parcel of their daily activities but as so many others have mentioned there are elderly and frail customers who frankly cannot travel that distance there are small businesses who cannot take that time off work on a daily basis to visit a branch in work hours. Um, and in uh, my own area of, of where it's uh, rural, those distances are so considerable that they um, are very challenging. And so it's not just a case of popping down to the nearest uh, branch. It's a case of taking a considerable chunk of time in a day to get there. And the question, therefore, for me is, are those banks serving local communities? Are those banks serving frail and elderly customers? Are those banks serving the small businesses? And judging by the debate we've had this evening, I would say that the resounding answer is no. We try and quantify the issue by quoting um, figures for, from which or from YouGov, but the impact on individuals who are dependent on visiting those branches is enormous. Graham Day mentioned um, the evidence uh, in Angus uh, and in rural areas and Claire Hawhey also talked about her constituency and the lack of privacy there is in some of the alternatives like post offices. Jamie Halkwood Johnson talked about Keith uh, and Lossiemouth um, and removing the ATMs and the continuing dependence that we all have on cash. Now at the last um, debate uh, in September I promised to write to both Link and the payment system regulator to seek their assurances that no ATM in a vulnerable community would close until a new operator was found and that communities would not be left without free access to cash. Because access to cash and the ability to deposit cash remains a critical issue, particularly for small businesses and rural communities. And it's clear that there will be a continuing long-term need for access to cash banking services in Scotland. Now, I wrote to uh, the chief executive of uh, Link, and I'm pleased to say that he responded, um, and I intend to meet with him to discuss their um, support and commitment to Scotland. Richard Lockhead also talked about um, the, the closures in uh, rural Scotland with 40% of high street banks um, closing in his constituency in the last eight years. And also the importance of the last branch standing, as it were, in some of these communities and the need for extra safeguards, which I would wholeheartedly support. And George Adam talked again about uh, being older people that are left to bear the brunt of these banks' uh, decisions to close branches and the point that at the end of the day banks rely on our custom banks rely on customers and there is a critical point there in terms of customers um, voting with their feet when it comes to supporting uh, local banks. Monica Lennon made an important point I think that whilst we may look at the isolated impact of branch closures in our own communities or constituencies there is a commun cumulative impact of these um, branch closures over the course of the last few years. And 68% 60 of small businesses saying that a local branch was still important. Um, and Stuart Stevenson talked about the adverse impact on those that are most dependent. Scotland has fared disproportionately badly with a reported 367 branches closing across the country and recent figures from which show that the UK has lost almost two thirds of its bank branch network in the past 
30 years, leaving a fifth of households more than three kilometres from their nearest current account provider. Now, as the Minister for the Digital Economy, I recognise that customers, uh, in many cases, are choosing to bank in different ways. But digital should never be a means of excluding customers. It should never be a means of excluding those that are most dependent on a physical bank presence. Whilst there has been great developments... Yes. Morris Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the issue about the alternatives to banking in the rural areas is something I had to look into in relation to my role in community safety. But the issues to using the post office as a means of banking lies in the hands of the Banking Association, of which there are 28 members. One of them is the Allied Irish Bank, which obviously is the one that banks the uh, post office. Okay. Uh, now, the, it's quite clear when I spoke to them is that there is an opportunity to resolve this issue to give the, bank, to give the post office in our rural areas maximum banking facilities. Now, has the minister ever discussed with the banking association in the United Kingdom to get the post office approved for full banking facilities? Because they understand that is possible and it, it lies in the hands of the banking association. And it's something you may have to address down to, to Westminster but I would implore you to do so because I think that will solve a lot of problems because I've met with people on the islands and things like that and other rural areas and they say there is no problem in doing that. I th um, take as long as you like, Minister, to, right. to finish what you're saying. It was a, that a long question, intervention. Because it's a fair question. And as he quite rightly said, the UK government retains legislative and regulatory responsibility for banking. And we have raised the issue of closures in a number of ways to try and mitigate the impact of closures directly with the UK government calling for access to essential banking services to be maintained. But I shall take that specific point away. And earlier this year, the Scottish government convened a roundtable discussion between the main Scottish banks on the issue of branch closures and the provision of banking services. And we've now established a banking and economy group as a subgroup of the Financial Services Advisory Board, chaired by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy, Fair Work and Scottish Financial Enterprise. And through this group, we'll continue to engage with banks on the various issues that have been raised. Sandra White, I thank the Minister for taking that intervention. It's on, obviously, you know, the digital economy and things are changing. But what, whilst things are changing in banking at times, they tell us, things are also changing how people's um, benefits even are paid into banks. And that's a huge, huge problem. Monica Lennon raised that about the length. You've got to walk or you, you can't afford the bus fares. Would you raise that particular issue, please, in, in the subgroup that's, that's up there? Kate Forbes. Yeah, and I was going to close by making that assurance to Sandra White that I would raise specifically the concerns of her constituent directly with the Bank of Scotland, because the point that she makes there is such a valid one that I can quote statistics of the general impact, but for those individuals who are dependent on a physical branch presence, who are dependent on getting into a branch in order to be able to access cash, whose whole lives depend on being able to, to pay and to receive, whether it's um, their benefits, universal credit or other things, their whole lives are being impacted on. And I would happily make that assurance to raise the concerns of her constituents and more generally the social impact of branch closures directly with the banks themselves, because that impact cannot go um, unnoticed. Just today, I was speaking to a, a number of individuals, including representatives from Age UK, about um, the, the, how we increase digital participation with uh, an older generation. And again, people quoted figures of the number of um, individuals over the age of 60, 37% over the age of 60, don't use the internet. That means they are being entirely excluded from local accessible free to use banking service if they're not online and that for me is a massive problem and I can commit to the chamber to continue to raise these issues recognising that the Scottish Government does not have the regulatory or the legislative frameworks but will continue to raise these issues with the banks themselves directly and with the UK Government in order to get banks to recognise the social impact not just the commercial impact of the decisions that they make and that at the end of the day they are accountable to their customers who will vote for their with their feet if their um, concerns or interests are not taken into account by the banks thank you that concludes the debate and this meeting is closed